Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Dr. Jean Chan, and I'm so happy to be here to dive into what UV damage does to your skin. And I apologize, I'm recovering from a laryngitis. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. So essentially today, what I'm gonna be going through are what the consequences are of not consistently wearing sunscreen and protecting your skin from UV damage. One might say, this is the good type of fear mongering, right? So let's dive in. So we all know that too much UV is bad for you. I'm sure you've all seen this classic photo of a truck driver. It's always popping up on social media to scare the teens into putting on sunscreen. And you can see that on the left side, the side closest to the driver's side window in the US has extensive wrinkling, furrowing, some hyperpigmentation, some sunspots. And this is a fantastic demonstration of the extent of UV damage alone um, that can happen on the skin, since in this one person, genetics, environmental pollutants like cigarette smoke are controlled for. You can see that the right side has significantly less wrinkling and pigmentary changes. And again, this is a wonderful visual demonstration that too much chronic UV exposure is harmful. The World Health Organization actually has UV radiation, either from the sun or from tanning beds, as a known carcinogen to humans, the same as cigarette smoke. So over the course of this talk, I'll be discussing the short-term effects of UV overexposure, sunburns and tanning, as well as the long-term effects, including sun damage, wrinkles, sunspots, and how skin cancer develops. So before we get into that, what is UV? UV light is radiation emitted from the sun more than 95% of the sun's UV radiation that reaches the Earth's surface, surface is UVA. Practically all of the UVC and a lot of the UVB is absorbed by the oxygen and ozone in the Earth's atmosphere. This UV is absorbed by biologic molecules, primarily DNA, as well as protein and lipids in the skin. And this UV damage can can damage and kill unprotected cells. So in order to survive in this environment, all living organisms had to develop protective mechanisms in order to prevent UV induced cell death in order to maintain the stability of their genome. So our main defense against UV is the skin. It's quite effective in protecting the rest of the organism from harmful effects of solar radiation especially since UV penetration radiation does not penetrate any deeper than the skin. But within the skin, the depth of penetration of UV light is wavelength dependent. So the longer the wavelength, the deeper the penetration. So UVA has the longest wavelength at 350 nanometers, and that does penetrate through the epidermis, the top layer of the skin, into the superficial to mid dermis where the collagen lives. UVB has a shorter wavelength, about 300 nanometers, and that absorbs at most to the very superficial portion of the dermis, but is mostly in the epidermis. UVC, again, if it did reach the earth's surface, would primarily be absorbed in the upper portions of the epidermis. So let's dive into the short-term consequences of UV overexposure. We all are familiar with sunburn as a sign that we've been out in the sun too long. And if it's really bad, some of you might have seen some blistering. Both UVA and UVB can cause sunburn. UVA contributes to more of that immediate redness, whereas UVB contributes to the redness that you feel a few hours later after a beach day at the sun when you feel like, oh, your skin suddenly feels warmer, redder, and more tender. On a microscopic level, UV exposure can lead to the death of your skin cells your keratinocytes, which is seen here as these sunburn cells. These pink blobs are dead apoptotic keratinocytes, again, known as sunburn cells. Essentially, this is your cell pushing the self-destruct button after irreparable damage has been done to the cellular DNA from this UV overexposure. 
And you may have observed in yourself or others that repeated sunburns can result in thickened skin, which is your skin's protective mechanism to shield itself from more UV damage. Microscopically um, and on a cellular level, there's a complex cascade of signaling, increased inflammation, and attempts to repair any UV damage sustained, which will lead to more of the long-term consequences down the road, which I will discuss in a bit. So if a sunburn is like an acute overdose of UV, tanning is a protective adaptive mechanism to protect you from chronic exposure to UV. Melanin is what gives your skin pigment and can be thought of as built-in sunscreen. UVA specifically triggers an immediate pigment darkening that is due to oxidation and redistribution of existing melanin. The delayed tanning response is more from UVB and typically happens about three days after exposure. This is due to an increased number of actual melanocytes, more pigment production, and an increased transfer of melanosomes to keratinocytes. And again, this takes a while. And this um, figure from a paper does a nice job of showing after a week of chronic UV exposure, there's much more melanin distributed you know, present in the basal layer as well as distributed throughout the epidermis. So it's important to remember that even though a, tan, a tan may be a signal that you're healthy, it's actually a sign that your skin has experienced UV damage. So just to dive in a little bit more into the melanin's role of UV protection. So melanin is essentially our body's sunscreen and protects our cells from UV damage. First of all, it acts as a physical barrier and scatters UV, particularly here when it is collected above the nucleus of the keratinocyte, it forms a melanin cap. It also acts as an absorbent filter, much like the sunscreens we put on our skin that reduces the penetration of UV through the dermis. They've done some calculations and it's estimated that the efficacy of, sunscreen, of melanin as a sunscreen is about SPF two, maybe as high as SPF four. So this just tells us that melanin absorbs up 50 to 75% of UV radiation. That's not great. There's still a lot of UV radiation that can potentially wreak havoc in our skin. It's also important to remember that people that have more melanin in their skin do have more of this built-in protection, which is why people with darker skin tend to have less sequelae of long-term UV exposure, less risk of um, typical UV associated skin cancers. Melanin also acts as an antioxidant. It is a free radical scavenger. Free radicals cause a lot of this damage. Um, so we want to reduce as much of that hanging around the skin as possible. And this chart over here, I know it's a little bit small, just roughly demonstrates or shows the cascade that occurs when our skin is exposed to UV. So once the skin is exposed to UV, you do have some DNA or cell damage. That cell damage sends out signals that um, trigger the redistribution of melanin to the upper levels of the epidermis. It triggers increasing that melanocyte density. It helps um, trigger increased melanin production. So essentially it's like a tripwire that activates defenses to protect the skin. So if sunburns and tannings don't deter you from getting more sun exposure, let's really dive into how long-term sun exposure um, man how the damage of long-term sun exposure manifests you won't see these changes for at least two to three decades. So once you, which is why once you see these changes in the skin, it's much more difficult to reverse. So prevention really is the best treatment for sun damage. So let's talk about photoaging first. This is an umbrella term that encompasses all of the changes of the skin due to chronic exposure to UV light. So this includes fine lines and wrinkling, the texture changes, cobblestoning, roughness, pigmentation changes. These changes are primarily due to UVA. Remember, it has that longer wavelength that penetrates deeper into the actual dermis where the collagen is present. UVA can pass through window glass, hence 
worse damage on the driver's side, the left side in the US. And, um, you know, some of these changes can also be due to aging in general, volume loss, dry skin, as well as environmental pollutants like tobacco smoke. But we're going to focus on how UV can accelerate photo aging. So let's talk about wrinkles. They're the first thing that come to mind when you think about how UV damages the skin. This is primarily due to the damage done to the collagen and elastin of the dermis. Collagen and elastin provide the firmness, bounce, and support that you see in youthful skin that has not been subjected to chronic sun exposure. Chronic UVA exposure specifically leads to breakdown of the collagen and elastin fibers. So it reduces their structural integrity and it replaces that normal, happy, healthy collagen, which we see here in this top picture with something called solar elastosis. That's this mushy blue gray material. This leads to the texture irregularities you see in sun damaged skin. So wrinkles as well as that kind of cobble stoning that you can see in very photo damaged skin. Imagine collagen and elastin as, as a rubber band. When it's new and fresh, you can stretch it and it bounces right back. But think of an old rubber band. You stretch it, it off, it's brittle, has no bounce. You know, if you had an old spring, you get sagging in an old mattress. So this shows, you know, this histologic photo of how much solar elastosis is in the dermis should demonstrate to you how difficult it is to treat photo age skin once it gets to this point, because essentially you would have to do procedures that completely get rid of the solar elastosis and stimulate new collagen production in its place. So again, prevention is much, much more effective than treating these effects after the fact. I won't go over this chart extensively, but it's just to illustrate to you the complex cascade of events that occurs when your skin is exposed to UV. So underpinning photoaging is a chronic inflammatory response to UV light. Um, once the skin is exposed to UV, there's a signaling cascade. You can see it's quite complex that results in increased degradation of collagen and elastin, as well as down regulation of new production of collagen and elastin. Again, which leads to wrinkling and sagging that we see in photo damaged skin. This is a really nice study from the British Journal of Dermatology from 1999. They biopsied skin from sun exposed and non exposed non-sun exposed areas, and they compared the microscopic findings. So they found that in sun damaged epidermis, so that's this, these bottom photos here, there's significant thinning of the epidermis at the bottom of the wrinkle. They also saw reduction in skin barrier proteins, desmoplakins, filaggrin, transglutaminase um, at the bottom of the wrinkle specifically. So it suggests that there's less water retention and hydration of the epidermis, particularly at the bottom of wrinkles. So this is why, you know, moisturizing your skin and using humectants like hyaluronic acid can help temporarily plump up and reduce the appearance of wrinkles. They also found that at the dermal epidermis Thermal junction, there's a decrease of supportive collagen four and collagen seven. Um, so again, think of a sagging couch or a mattress, you have less support underpinning the epidermis. And then within the dermis, like we had said before, they found abnormal degraded elastic fibers, as well as atrophy of collagen fibers. And this variation of collagen and elastic fibers, solar elastosis, again, leads to these texture irregularities we see in sun damaged skin. They also found alteration in um, the chondroitin sulfates in the dermis. So um, these are molecules that pull in water and again, give the skin that supple youthful appearance. Um, so it's very interesting how complex UV damage um, is manifested in the skin. So moving on to solar lentigines, these are known as H spots, sunspots, liver spots. These are a very, very common sign of chronic sun exposure. And these are triggered 
um, chronic sun exposure triggers the local proliferation of melanocytes, as well as accumulation of melanin within the keratinocytes. They typically arise in patients over the age of 40 and clinically are pale brown, but sometimes they can be quite large and patch-like and can appear to have irregular borders. So these arise, that's thought to be due to um, sustained mutations in the keratinocytes in the epidermis as well as melanocytes. Um, and, you know, again, these can be treated with like lightning creams or lasers, but if you expose your skin to UV again, these do frequently recur. So you've probably seen these horrifying images used to highlight sun damage lurking underneath the surface. Uh, UV photography, that's, that's what you see here, utilizes a, cer a certain wavelength of light that is preferentially absorbed by melanin. It sinks it in. So in areas where there's a lot of pigment and melanin, um, even in those that we can't see with our naked eye, those are highlighted. So the UV photography makes sun damage immediately apparent even before we can see it with our naked eye. And UV photography has been used to scare, uh, I mean, motivate people to adopt better sun protection habits. Um, these images here on the right are from a study from the Journal of American, of, uh, American Academy of Dermatology. They found that subclinical freckling, see you can see here, um, was correlated with melanoma risk factors in 12 year olds. So these photos are 12 year olds. And so 12 year olds that have more um, risk factors for melanoma, including fair skin, red hair, blue eyes, history of sunburns, you can see under UV photography, they have more sustained sun damage. So it's, it's pretty um, dramatic, these photos. And this photo on the left is of a 35 year old woman who again, clinically looks like has does not have sun damage on her skin, but using the UV photography, you see um, a lot of subclinical solo lentigines and, and melanin production. So these photographs are great because it can help bridge that gap of the long latency period between UV damage and when you can actually see the damage with the naked eye. So the hope is that using these types of photos can help motivate people to adopt um, safer sun protection habits, more consistent sunscreen use. So other changes that are seen in the skin um, from chronic UV damage, um, one is poikiloderma. So this is not really talked about that much, especially on social media or, or in the public sphere, but I see it a lot. Um, this is that red-brown modeling or discoloration in areas of chronic sun exposure. This is due to increased vessel formation and dilation of the existing blood vessels in the skin that leads to that background redness. Those are called telangiectasias. Um, often you see it on the neck as well as on the chest, and you can see it in somebody that's had a lot of sun exposure, your late 30s, early 40s. Solar purpura is something I see a lot of in my patient population, particularly in the sixth, seventh, and eighth decades of life. Um, it's essentially easy bruising, but the reason why you're having easy bruising is because you have increased capillary fragility due to decreased structural integrity of the collagen and elastin. So this is how I explain it to my patients. Think of the um, supportiveness of raw pasta or spaghetti versus the supportive ability of cooked, overcooked um, spaghetti. So um, solar elastosis essentially has the texture of cooked spaghetti, does not provide any support for the fragile vessels in the skin. So even the slightest bump can lead to bursting open of these capillaries and a bruise. Um, and I tell my patients, there's nothing we can do to prevent this from happening aside from me inventing that time machine and giving your younger self a sun hat and some sunscreen. So let's switch gears and talk about how chronic UV damage leads to skin cancer formation. This process is called photocarcinogenesis. And in a nutshell, it's a stepwise accumulation of spe specific genetic changes in a single cell. 
Once that single cell gathers enough mutations, it begins to divide rapidly, unchecked in a process called clonal expansion. And then after decades, that's when you can see a clinically apparent tumor. So just remember, every time you tan or burn, these DNA mutations are accumulating in your skin cells, forming what we know as DNA photo products. Um, UVB is primarily responsible um, for the process of photocarcinogenesis, although UVB, there's more research coming out that shows UVA um, can play a role as well. So this is a nice chart that shows the mechanism our skin has adopt, have adopted to help protect or prevent this photocarcinogenesis cascade. So hair is meant to block UV from even reaching our skin. Once UV does reach our skin, that's when pigmentation, epidermal thickening, and antioxidant enzymes are um, meant to help prevent UV damage. Once the cells do sustain UV damage, there are cellular repair mechanisms, cell cycle arrest, or even apoptosis or cell death to prevent those mutations from persisting in the cells in the body. Once those mutations are persistent in the genome, um, the body has immunosurveillance mechanisms that try to remove those mutated cells. So patients that are immunosuppressed do have a higher risk of skin cancer because of the loss of those immune surveillance mechanisms. So this just shows how many protective mechanisms we've developed over the course of evolution and how important it is to um, you know, help support these mechanisms by preventing UV from hitting our skin to begin with. So these are photos of patients with oculocutaneous albinism. These patients have genetic mutations um, where they do not make any melanin. So therefore do not have that built-in um, sunscreen in the skin. These patients in particular grew up in Africa without much education or access to sunscreen or sun protective measures. So these patients accumulated many mutations from chronic UV exposure that led to aggressive skin cancers much earlier than people uh, than people that do make melanin or don't have those mutations. So on the left is a young woman in her 20s with a very large aggr aggressive squamous cell carcinoma. And on the right is a gentleman with large basal cell carcinomas pretty diffusely over his body. And I'm showing this to you to demonstrate how important each of these protective mechanisms are. And again, what can happen if you accumulate too much UV damage too rapidly. So diving into specific types of skin cancer, the most common type of skin cancer is a basal cell carcinoma. This comes from mutated basal epithelial cells, so the cells at the base of the epidermis, um, thought to be due to mutations in the patch tumor suppressor gene. This is the most common type of skin cancer, but it's also the most indolent form, so very rarely does it spread to other parts of the body, um, but it is locally destructive. So if one was left untreated for five, 10 years, you can have pretty significant local uh, destruction, um, a loss of normal tissue and structures in that area. Patients often describe it as a pimple that doesn't go away. And a clinical sign that's very common, but again, not really talked about, is something that bleeds easily. So if you wash your face, you know, even the slightest touch causes it to bleed, that should raise a red flag. Microscopically, you have these blue tumor lobules within the dermis. So the next most common skin cancer is a squamous cell carcinoma. This comes from mutated keratinocytes that predominantly have mutations in the P53 tumor suppressor gene. Clinically, it's characterized by keratin overgrowth. So you typically have, this is a dramatic uh, demonstration of what we call a cutaneous horn with a pain, painful tender nodule underneath. And you can see these mutated cells forming this tumor in the dermis. 
Melanoma is the most um, talked about type of skin cancer because it is the most deadly. It comes from malignant melanocytes. It's the least common, but is again, the deadliest. It has the highest risk of metastasis to other areas of the body. Um, UVA has been implicated in melanoma development. Um, people that have fair skin, blue eyes, history of blistering sunburns during childhood and um, numerous nevi um, are at a bit of a higher risk for melanoma. It's important to note that 70% of melanomas are actually de novo, meaning not associated with a pre-existing mole. So you're really looking for that new spot that looks unusual. So asymmetric, has irregular borders, um, has multiple colors within it, um, has a large diameter and quickly is changing or evolving. Um, I usually teach my patients what I call the ugly duckling sign. So a spot that really doesn't look like any of your other moles and freckles that you've had for a long time. So lastly, does sunscreen prevent skin cancer? Yes. Um, there have been a couple of big studies uh, done in the 90s where over 1,600 people in Queensland, Australia were followed for about 14 years. So this is an amazing randomized controlled trial. Um, one group was um, tasked with doing sunscreen on a daily basis for a couple of years, and the other group was kind of left to do whatever they usually do, they saw significantly, um, statistically significant reduction in non-melanoma skin cancers and melanomas in the patients that were randomized in the daily consistent sunscreen use group. This type of study will never be done again because we know that sunscreen prevents skin cancer. So it would be unethical to randomize people into a group where they didn't wear sunscreen. Um, again, a reminder that UV is a known carcinogen. So in this age of some controversies, controversies around sunscreen use, it's important to remember that we know it prevents skin cancer and skin cancer does have the potential to cause morbid morbidity as well as mortality in us. So this is Again, just a reminder to say yes to sun protection, sunscreen, as well as seeking shade, doing things early in the morning, late in the afternoon, wearing sun protective clothing, as well as using sunscreen. So it has been wonderful to be a part of this amazing free e-conference. I hope this information has been illuminating to you. And at this point, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and you can always find more information about skin disease and dermatology at my website or on Instagram. Thank you so much. All right, Jen, I'm gonna stop this recording and uh, Hope it worked out.